going to actually well, strive to preach a uh, lesson uh, about the Bible and a, a lesson about the Lord. Some of the times when I go out preaching, I try to look at passages that we've studied in the school. And obviously those things are uh, on my mind because I've just taught them. And so sometimes I'll go back and pull out a lesson from that uh, study. Now we're going to be looking at John chapter 1 in verses 1 through 5 here in just a second. But that's, one of the, that's the reason why I chose this particular lesson because I taught it in school. But I can't give you what I gave them because we spent about, uh, I don't know, about almost two hours, maybe almost three, on just these first few verses. And it's, it is absolutely rich with information and material that we can gain from these particular verses. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, John recorded, this is John the Apostle, who is the writer of the gospel record of John. He wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that hath been made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth into the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Now clearly John had in mind, as he began his gospel record, to remind the reader of the very beginning of time. In the beginning... And that is a, a, obviously taken from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, etc. And so it, it is a clear reference to that. But John recorded that in the beginning was the Word. And most of us have heard of, and if we've done any study at all, we know that the word there is the word logos in the Greek. Although it... Uh, different ones pronounced a little bit different ways, but nonetheless, it's the word logos. We get our word logic from that particular word. And many have defined this particular term as the divine reason. And I think it's a good way of looking at this particular word. Now, John also identified for us who the word is. In verse 14 of this text, he said, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Clearly, from these texts, then, we know that the Word is a reference to Jesus Christ. So, the point of the very first statement, in the beginning was the Word, is the fact that the Word was at the point of beginning. He wasn't absent at the beginning. He was there, present at the beginning. But he takes it a step further than that. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, this particular time, and when he made this statement, and oftentimes in the original language, you actually have the word that's uh, a article before the word God. And that's what you have in this first statement. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, literally, the God. Ton theon is the actual Greek term that's used there. And the nominative form for those that speak Greek, because there are, or that know a little bit of Greek, probably a couple of you, maybe three of you, that uh, know that, and it's the, the nominative form of it is the word theos. And so it was tos theos, if it was actually a nominative form. But nonetheless, it is the God. It's a reference to the God of heaven. It's a reference to the Father. So not only was he in the beginning or at the beginning of time, he was present at that particular time, but he was with God the Father at the point of beginning. Now, it is interesting when you look at the word God, and going back to the Old Testament, there is a... Uh, a term that's translated God is Elohim. Most many of us that have looked into it, and I know for some of us this is getting into some real deep ideas, but nonetheless, I think it's necessary for us to do that. And, uh, and I don't think we ought to be real shallow all the time. We need to give some depth to, depth to what we think about. But the word Elohim is actually plural, and it's the word translated God throughout the Old Testament. It is interesting, it is the same word that's translated gods in the Old Testament. It is both 
a reference to the true God of heaven, the true and the living God, as well as sometimes in reference to the various gods of men, whether made out of wood, stone, or idols, or heathen, or whatever it might be. It's the same word in the original language. But there's another interesting part of that. Sometimes in some languages, and I, and I want you to think out of English a little bit and try to think in a little bit broader way, but sometimes in other languages, they use terms that show respect. And sometimes they have what they call, in some languages, a respective pronoun or a respective form of a particular word. And that's what we have in the Hebrew language. The word Elohim is a reference to God, but it's also used in a plural showing respect to God the Father. Now it's very interesting when you, when you get this concept in mind because you go back to Genesis 1 and verse 1. He says, in the beginning was, or yeah, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And literally, in the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. But it doesn't refer to a plurality of gods, but it refers to the respective word for God. It shows respect. It shows honor. It shows glory. It is used in a plural way. But what's even interesting, more interesting, at least in my mind, of that is the fact that the verb in, in the beginning, God created, created is the verb, the predicate, that's what a couple, a couple of people were talking about this morning, but the predicate, and that word is singular. So in the beginning, literally translated, in the beginning, God's created, if you put it in English. So we have to, in, in English, we put an S to make a verb singular, and we put an S to make a noun plural. It's kind of confusing sometimes, but that's what we do. But it's the plural God created singular the world. Now, if you drop down to verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, you also have a little bit more information that, that helps us to understand this. And God said, let us make man in our image, etc. Now, the word God here, and God said, is Elohim, showing the plural, the I am at the end of it is, is what makes it plural. And God said, and said is singular. He said, now notice, <laughs> and God said, let us make man, make is also singular. Now, some people in English will make the play there that, that well, you know, the us or the plural word God refers to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If that be the case, here's the problem with that. You have three gods, and we're guilty of tritheism rather than guilty of one God. Well, with that in mind, jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses, really verses 4 and 5. This is the exhortation of Moses when he gave it to the children of Israel before they crossed into the promised land. And we recognize verse 5 that we are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. But notice verse number 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said that the Lord our God is one Lord. Now that's kind of interesting when you look at it in the Hebrew. He said the Lord, being the word Jehovah or what we use for Jehovah, if you didn't know it, the Old Testament word Jehovah is not really, it's a, it's a word that's been supplied. The, the Israelites, they didn't translate the word that they used for Jehovah. They, it, it was simply four letters. And when you deal with transliteration, and that's what you're really dealing with, then those four letters have been transliterated into different letters. And so they come up with Jehovah, or they come up with Elohim, and they, they supplied then the, the vowels for the consonants that are, that are used there. Now, Jehovah really isn't all that much different than the word Elohim, if you, if you understand a little bit about language. 
The J in Old English is a Y sound. So, you know, in, in modern English, we make it a hard J or hard sound, but in Old English, it was a Y sound. And sometimes, even in British English, it still is a Y sound. I found it interesting years ago when I went to Latvia the first time in 1991, I think. And much of the English that you'd find in Latvia were, was British English. And instead of spelling it L-A-T-V-I-A, Latvia, uh, like we spell it in, in uh, American English, they all spell it L-A-T-J, uh, or uh, L-I-T-V-J-A, Latvia. So, so the J then becomes a Y sound. And when you think about King James Version of the Bible written in, 14, uh, in the 1400s, then what, what do we have? We have a, an old English. So that J then was a Y sound at that particular time and it's evolved into this harder sound. And so Yehovah, and is very similar then to Yahweh. So that's where that all comes from. But notice this text. He says, the Lord, Jehovah, is one Lord. Well, the Lord, God, rather, uh, the Lord, Jehovah, is one God. So he's, he then stated the Lord, Jehovah, is one Elohim, God's. So, you know, that kind of, in English, it kind of blows our mind. We, we, you know, it just, to think about it being the plural like that. But it is the plural, and it's a reference to the respective uh, noun in this particular case with reference to the God of heaven. It is also interesting that not every time the word uh, God is used in the Old Testament, it is the word Elohim, sometimes it's Elo, or like we have the Aramaic in, in one of the uh, recorded passages concerning the death of Christ when he said uh, in the Matthew's account it's Eli, Eli, but in I think it's Mark's account it's Eloi, Eloi. Well, that comes from Elohim, or it comes from Eloi in the Hebrew and so it's that word God. And so not always was it used in plural, but usually in the majority of the time, it's actually a plural noun that's used there, but it shows respect. It shows honor to God. So what do we have then? We have a single individual, a single person, God. He's one person, but he portrays himself or he identifies himself in three persons. And that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he's a single God. So going back to John then, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, indicating two individuals, two personages. And yet, he says, and the Word was God. Now, there's a difference between the first statement and the second statement. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with literally the God, talking about God the Father, and the Word was no article there, no definite pronoun, and the Word was God. Now, when I took Greek way back, way back in, well, a long time ago, the person that taught us Koine Greek, taught us to translate this idea as a God kind of being. And that's really, I think, portrays more the meaning here. I know for sure it's not like the Watchtower Witnesses. Now, they're not Jehovah's. They're the Watchtower Witnesses. Let's get, make it very plain here. In other words, it's not, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses because they don't witness for Jehovah. They are watchtower witnesses. They witness for their watchtower publication and etc. So when we look at them and in their New World's translation, you know what this thing says? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a little g, God. Now, I don't know about you, but that's just downright wrong. 
I mean, it's taking the deity of Christ and lowering it down. And then if you start reading in their material, you're going to find out that not only do they believe he's a little g God, but he was the first created being. That God the Father created him. And then, according to their doctrine, he created the rest of, 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 of everything that's been created. But we're going to get to that here in just a second because there's a number of testations within the scriptures that the agent of creation was the Son. He was the one that spoke the world into existence. But he was with God and he was a God kind of being. Now how do we refer to a God kind of being? Well, we call that kind of being deity or divinity. And that's actually what he's, he's talking, what John was recording in this particular verse. In the beginning was God, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and the Word was deity. The Word was divine. That's what that particular verse has to say. Now notice in verse 2, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So now in verse 2 is a reiteration of the first statement that he made. And so that we don't miss the point, because sometimes we miss the point. Not only was he in the beginning or at the beginning of time, he was with God the Father at the beginning of time. So the Word was made, or the, uh, and the, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So not only was he with God, he was then reemphasized with God. He was at the point of beginning and existed before the beginning, and he continued to exist after the beginning. So in other words, he is an eternal being. He's not a created being. He is an eternal being. He has all the attributes of God. And so we pop over to Colossians 2 and verse 9, and Paul wrote that in him dwelleth the fullness, not a part of the Godhead, but the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, he has every single characteristic that God has, that, that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit has. Jesus Christ has every single one of them. So he was the creator. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He is omniscient. He has all the characteristics of God. There is nothing lacking in Jesus Christ whatsoever as far as God is concerned. Now, I don't know about you, but that, wants me, that makes me want to bow my knee, as Paul would state in the book of Ephesians, bow my knee in order to worship Him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now notice verse 3. Uh, I guess I have to start all over. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things, there you go, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Now, tell me this. As you look at that particular verse, what was created that wasn't created by the Word? Nothing. Everything was created by the world, by the Word. Now, if that be the case, then if everything was created by the Word, and I'm going to believe John, the inspired writer, more than I'm going to believe a watchtower witness, but if everything was created by the Word and the Word was created, then the Word must have created itself. But in order for it to create himself, then he had to exist. It's self-contradictory. And so it, it cannot be. You cannot create oneself. And so it's simply not the, uh, what the Bible says. So he is the creator of everything. Well, there's a number of verses that talk about him being the creator of all things, such as Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, and also Hebrews chapter uh, 1 and verses 1 to 3. So he is then the creator of everything. And other verses, I think there's actually five attestations within Scripture, within the New Testament, that attest to the fact that He is the creator of everything. So when, when it says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, 
that all three persons of the Godhead, remember their unity of being that's portrayed in three different personages, but that unity of being, all three were there on that occasion. And nobody was excluded from that. But the actual voice that spoke the world into existence was Jesus Christ. And he created all things. And without him, nothing was created that hath been created. He created every single thing. And again, one of the most basic characteristics of God is the fact that he is the creator. I want to bow my knee to him in order to worship our creator. Well, now we get to the fifth verse, and that is, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth into the darkness, but the co darkness comprehendeth it not. So in him was life. Well, as we think about life, life isn't like the evolutionists think. The, what, I don't remember the fellow's name um, uh, off the top of my head right now. I see it in my mind, but at any rate. But he said, life began in a crystal. When asked, where did life begin? In a crystal. And someone questioned him on that, and he said, uh, he said, well, I told you where it began. It began in a crystal. He was, became angry, and he said, more strongly, it began in a crystal. But that, uh, that really doesn't answer that question. Where did it begin, or how did it begin? Well, you know, life did not begin in a crystal. Life always existed. Now, how, do, how can I say that? Because God always existed. That's why I can say life always existed. Now we flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. He only in him hath immortality dwelling in lights. He only has true immortality. Now the word immortality is literally the, the absence of death. It's the negative of the word death. He, he doesn't have death. He only has life. That's all he has is life that dwells within him. In him was life. And we get life not from, the, from a crystal that happens to form all of a sudden, but we get life from God. We get life from Jesus Christ. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Now, light and darkness are opposites, obviously. And there are a number of ways that light is used. It, it always shows influence. And when you flip on the light, it influences and it changes things. And we've all been into a room, and what, whether we like it or not, especially on a, on a uh, house that's built on a slab, well, you know what I'm talking about. You live in Oklahoma, and no matter what you do, you find once in a while you flip on the light and there's a cricket on the floor. Well, you know, what happens to that cricket? Well, almost immediately, he wants to get away. He wants to get somewhere where, where he doesn't want to get stomped or moved or, or whatever. And he, so he, he tries to get away. Well, that's what happens when life comes into this world. The light then influences, and life is dependent upon physical life, is dependent upon light. And light then helps us to understand what God is. Well, God is everything good. He's joy. He provides life. He, he has everything that represents good. So in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And it shines into the dark world. But notice he said, but the world comprehendeth it not. Now you would think that since we know who our Creator is, you would think that men would want to know who God is. But God reveals light, and that exposes darkness, and it exposes what's in the dark. And because it exposes what's in the dark, people don't want the light. 
when do people do evil things? Well, you, you know, if you, if you ever go to Walmart, sometime if you really want to experience something unique, go to Walmart in the middle of the night and see what's there. I mean, there are all kinds of strange people. <laughs> and, you know, they're doing these things at night. Why? Because they don't want others to know about it. And so the light shines into the darkness, but the darkness doesn't want it. So they, they continue their evil activity at night because they don't want to be exposed. They don't want to have the light to come upon them. And so they continue their evil activity at night. And that's why they don't hear the gospel. That's why they don't want the gospel light because their deeds are exposed by the gospel light. So five verses that are absolutely marvelous. But as I look at those five verses, and though I've given you kind of a summary of, of some thoughts behind those, but I can't help but want to bow my knee to the Father and to the Son. Now, please don't misunderstand that I do believe that there are three persons of the Godhead. I don't believe that Genesis 1 teaches that, nor do I believe that Genesis 1 and verse 26 teaches that, or Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 teaches that. We have to go back into the Word. And I always remember the different debates that Guy and Woods would have with what's called the Oneness Doctrine folks, and who teach that there was only one person of the Godhead, and there's not three persons that are revealed in the Godhead. And he would use the baptism of John, that is, the baptism of Jesus by John the baptizer. When Jesus came to John to be baptized, you remember John immersed Jesus in the Jordan, and as he came up out of that water, the Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. It's actually the descent, not the dove being in the or the Spirit being in the form of dove, but the descent of the Spirit was like the form of a dove. But nonetheless, the Spirit descended upon Jesus Christ uh, like a dove descends. And the Father spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, if they are all the same person, if they're all the same personage, then here you've got a ridiculous story. You have Jesus being baptized, and as, I mean, they think Jesus is the, the one person of the Godhead. So you have Jesus being baptized, Jesus descending upon himself, talking about schizophrenic, and Jesus speaking about himself, I am my own beloved son. Now, that makes that whole account ridiculous. So we know that there are three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but they have a unity of being, something that is hard for us to think about and to understand, and we have all kinds of pictures that people have painted with that in mind, but all of them fail because they're one being, they're one in unity, and they think alike and they are alike. And that's why Jesus could say, when you see me, you've seen the Father. And though they are different beings or different uh, personages, but uh, they are one being. So don't get me wrong about the, the Godhead. There are three personages, but they have a singular being. And that the respective pronoun then, or respective noun in this case, is used with reference to them, the Elohim and they are worthy of our worship. I know the things that we've talked about tonight really isn't one that would cause us to want to respond in order to obey the gospel, but the purpose really is simply to cause us to want to worship God. He is marvelous. He is beyond our comprehension. We're finite. He is infinite, and He is eternal, and we then should worship Him because he's such a great God. If we can help you in any way and you'd like to respond to the invitation, the, ex the invitation is, is extended as together we stand and sing to encourage you.